So let's talk skin infections, uh, particularly bacterial skin infections. So one thing to keep in mind is that your skin is actually an incredibly good barrier. So most whatever that infects your skin is going to have to get into your body through a wound. And so I dealt with wound infections in a different video. However, there are bacteria that can infect your skin without getting into your body. And in this case, they actually cause um, uh, usually like they grow on the surface of the skin or they use one of the few ways to get inside of the skin. So uh, the resident flora of your skin consists, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of them, but there are three main categories uh, because your skin is fairly antimicrobial. Remember that your skin has um, salt, which most bacteria don't particularly like. Uh, it has acid from the sebum, as well as oil. Um, you have various other toxic components that are put onto your skin, and all of this helps to make your skin a good barrier. But there are some bacteria that naturally live in this environment. Uh, and actually, different parts of the skin are going to have different bacteria living on them and different amounts of bacteria living on them. So usually the drier the region of a skin is, the fewer bacteria are capable of living there. So your back might have only a thousand bacteria per square centimeter, whereas say uh, a relatively moist region like your armpit could have 10 million bacteria per square centimeter. There are also going to be different bacteria uh, diphtherioids, uh, particularly uh, Propionobacterium, uh, like to grow in oily regions of the body. So um, your upper back, your forehead and scalp, upper chest, uh, and they like to grow within hair follicles, uh, producing acne. Staph, which is more salt tolerant and uh, used to drier environments, grows all over the body, but might be outcompeted by diphtherioids in the oily regions. Um, yeasts, particularly a yeast called Malassiza, uh, is also a common, well, not bacteria, but a common thing to find growing on your skin. Um, and they're usually, they're lipid dependent, so they're only going to really grow in oily regions of the skin. So particularly not on the palms of your hand, but the more oil, the better for them. Many of the bacteria that can infect your skin are going to be the ones that live there professionally. So first skin condition, which probably most people have had at some point in their life, is acne vulgaris. Um, acne, right? Pimples, zits. We've all had them a few times. Uh, this is usually going to be caused by uh, Propionobacterium, uh, although Staph aureus can cause acne in some cases. Uh, but this is the, the most common cause of it. Signs and symptoms. Uh, this is a infection. Technically not an infection because it's not actually getting past your barrier, but it's a colonization of the sebaceous glands. Bacteria get into the sebaceous glands, cause some inflammation. Uh, the sebaceous glands then fill up with oil and sometimes pus uh, and become enlarged. Uh, sebaceous glands are always going to be connected to hair follicles. So uh, there's going to be a hair follicle near there. Uh, the blockage leads to accumulations of sebum, produces blackheads and whiteheads. Uh, usually it's the metabolic products of the bacteria that cause the inflammatory response, attract white blood cells to the area, creating the pustule. 
Um, if the uh, the pimple bursts, that can lead to a temporary wound that will allow uh, whatever bacteria was infecting the local area to cause an abscess or other wound infection. So this is why it's usually a bad idea to just go pop in your pimples. Um, the Propionobacterium uh, likes to live in oily environments, so the more oily you are, uh, the more likely you are to get it. And um, during puberty, uh, the increased hormone levels result in greater sebum production, hence puberty-associated acne. Uh, treatment and prevention. Um, prevention is, I mean, you know, wash your face, um, good hygiene, stuff like that. Uh, squeezing your pimples, like I said, popping your pimples is usually ill-advised. It can serve as a route of infection. Uh, and um, there are lots of commercially available treatments uh, and preventatives. Most of them are going to be some form of something that just basically reduces the amount of oil on your skin. Uh, in extremely severe cases, like there are people who have clinically bad cases of acne, um, often those might be caused by Staph aureus. There are antibiotics that can treat it, but they are um, not frequently prescribed because they can lead to a buildup of uh, resistant organisms on your skin. So staphylococcal skin diseases. Uh, they're like staph epidermidis lives on your skin all the time and usually does not cause any sort of imbalance or pathogenesis, but Staph aureus living on your skin can, depending upon the virulence factors that it has. And as you see here, there are lots of different virulence factors that Staph aureus can have. Uh, probably the, so the first one you're likely to get is folliculitis which is staphylococcal uh, colonization of a hair follicle. So it, it hasn't actually gotten into your body, um, but it has infected the hair follicle leading to inflammation, basically pimples. Um, and uh, so you can get acne infection by staph aureus, it would be a, uh, an extensive case of folliculitis, um, the pimples can further develop into what's called a furuncle or boil, um, which is going to be a large, prominent pimple-looking thing. Um, redness, swelling, tenderness, pain, possible pus inside. Uh, the, the big problem with boils is if they burst, then the Staph aureus will almost certainly uh, infect the wound that results. Um, if you have like a bunch of furuncles in an area where they actually sort of start to join together and you get an infection of the entire area, uh, that's what's called a carbuncle which is a large area of basically many boils. The causative agent is Staph aureus, producing coagulase and clumping factor. Uh, and it's basically the Staph aureus gets into a hair follicle, spreads to the sebaceous gland. Uh, if it gets from there into the bloodstream, it can cause abscesses, it can cause toxic shock syndrome, it can cause all of the things that are talked about in the wound infection videos under staphylococcal wound infections. Um, but it's, um, you know, as long as the skin remains intact, that doesn't happen. However, having a furuncle or carbuncle or boil or whatever means that you do have a large amount of staph aureus on that part of your body. So 
um, any injury to any place near there is going to have a much higher likelihood of uh, Staph aureus contamination. Um, Staph aureus is found in the nares of nearly everyone um, at some point in their life. Uh, about 20% of people carry it continuously for a year or more, and 60% will be colonized for some part of a year with transient, uh, what's called your transient flora. Um, and it can be very easily transferred from person to person through direct contact or uh, uh, fomites. So you should uh, be careful and wear gloves if you are treating somebody with boils or carbons. Uh, as far as treatment goes, um, so boils or carbuncles can be require can require minor surgery or what's called lancing, which is basically where you drain the pus from them and then treat with antibiotics afterwards uh, because you don't want to allow the bacteria to infect the wound. And of course, it's Staph aureus. And Staph aureus is well known for being resistant to, uh, to antibiotics. So antibiotic treatment of these infections is something that you're definitely gonna want to discuss and because the more you use antibiotics, the more likely they are to acquire antibiotic resistance. Uh, prevention, I mean, it's sporadic, so it's hard, but you can definitely try to uh, prevent the spread of it by taking sanitary precautions when dealing with somebody who has uh, 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 staphylococcal ailments. Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. So uh, this is a, a fairly rare infection, fortunately. It's really nasty. Um, only some, about 5% of Staph aureus, can produce the toxins that cause it. The toxin is exfoliatin, um, and it mainly infects newborn children. Uh, the signs and symptoms begin with redness of the skin, malaise, irritability, and fever. Um, usually it's going to start around the nose, mouth, or genitalia, uh, places with notoriously thin skin. And within 48 hours, the skin will become wrinkled, fluid-filled blisters develop, and then the upper layer of skin will begin to peel off. Uh, this exfoliatin toxin actually causes the, uh, the top dead skin cell layers from the epidermis to peel away. So you basically lose your stratum cornea. Uh, that can then serve as a route of infection, right? So losing your stratum cornea is going to reduce the waterproofness of your skin, make your skin a less good barrier. The bacteria can then use that to infect your deeper tissues. Um, Usually the, uh, the infection is localized, but exfoliatin can get into the bloodstream and cause uh, damage, cause your skin to peel off uh, in distant places farther away from where the actual bacteria is. Transmission is usually going to be person to person, and um, it typically does not affect adults. Um, so there have been epidemic cases where one, uh, one care person in a nursery, uh, or daycare center or neonatal ward, um, is not taking, like you're supposed to change gloves in between handling each baby. And if you don't do that, you might carry staph aureus, uh, scalded skin staph aureus from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And then you've got a whole ward full of babies with their skin peeling off, which is uh, not good. Uh, the, uh, um, the risk of it is actually dehydration. Uh, at least you can also get secondary infection. Uh, but the primary risk is dehydration because if the top layer of your skin peels off, then it's no longer waterproof, which means that you lose water through your skin at a very quick rate. 
and especially in young children, they can't go get water when they're thirsty. They depend upon a regular feeding schedule, um, and uh, that means that it's very easy for them to become dehydrated in this case. Generally speaking, prompt therapy, uh, typically with antibiotics, is going to yield full recovery, but the faster it's caught, the better. Lyme disease. So uh, Lyme disease, I wasn't actually sure whether to categorize this as a wound infection or a skin infection, but uh, it's caused by a tick bite. Um, so they don't usually produce, I don't know, an actual wound, uh, but you could really classify it in either category. So Lyme disease is relatively recently discovered. Uh, it was discovered in the mid-70s in Lyme, Connecticut, though I should emphasize that it's been around forever, but uh, it was only really characterized in the 70s. Uh, the causative agent is a bacteria called uh, Bur Borrelia burgdorferi and was discovered and identified by Willy Burgdorfer whose name it bears. Uh, it, there are 25,000 cases each year, and it's the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. And it's not really that common anywhere outside of North America. Signs and symptoms. So uh, the disease actually happens in three phases or three stages. Um, the, the first stage, the primary infection, occurs around the site of the tick bite and uh, occurs usually within a few days of the tick bite. Uh, and it produces this very characteristic circular rash. Often what you'll get is a wide circular rash with a um, bare patch in between and then potentially another rash at the site of the infection. So this is referred to as a bullseye rash, and it is characteristic of this disease. Uh, nearby lymph nodes will enlarge. Uh, usually, the tick bite occurs on uh, one of your limbs. So those are going to be either your axillary lymph nodes in your armpits or your inguinal lymph nodes in your groin area. Uh, so they'll enlarge. Uh, and, uh, this can lead, you can also have sort of flu-like symptoms, chills, headaches, muscle whip pains, generalized inflammatory response. In the second phase, uh, the organism moves to other tissues, usually through the blood or lymphatic system. Uh, from the site of the infection and moves throughout the body. Um, this usually occurs two to eight weeks after the, uh, the rash shows up, and it can have a variety of different symptoms. Some people are asymptomatic, but the nervous system is affected, electro co electrical conduction to the heart can be impaired, uh, it can cause dizzy spells, fainting, uh, cardiovascular issues, sometimes paralysis of the face, headache, uh, neurological symptoms, difficulty concentrating, emotional instability, fatigue, depression, uh, difficulty walking, bunch of nervous system problems. And that will usually go away and you can then have reactivation in the tertiary stage. This occurs six months after the skin rash um, and involves often auto-inflammatory uh, uh, auto symptoms. So it's sort of an autoimmune disease. You get joint pain, swelling in various parts of the body, Actually, both the uh, stage two and stage three 
are more caused by your immune system attacking your body in an attempt to get rid of the bacteria than they are caused by the bacteria itself. And the third stage can persist throughout your lifetime um, and has been associated with a variety of other conditions which we don't really understand very well how it is related to. Causative agent, as I said, is Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a gram-negative microaerophilic spirochet. Uh, the pathogenesis, it gets into the skin through the tick bite, multiplies, migrates outwards. LPS causes an inflammatory reaction, um, hence you get the rash. It enters into the bloodstream, spreads to other parts of the body in stage two. The immune system responds and actually creates most of the symptoms. Uh, it's a zoonotic uh, disease. You get it from tick bites. And humans are not the intended target. Uh, naturally speaking, this tick is mostly moves between uh, deer mice and deer and the bacteria typically follows that. Like it spends part of its life cycle in the deer and then in the tick and then in the mouse and then back into the tick and then the offspring go back into the deer. Um, and that's where it usually wants to live. If the tick bites you because, I don't know, you're messing around with a dead deer or something like that, like tick can bite you if it can, uh, it, it'll get into you, it'll cause disease, but you're a dead-end host. You're not really where it, it normally lives. Uh, treatment and prevention. Uh, so prevention measures are, um, well, so it's an endemic disease. So if you are in the part of the country, which I'll show you in a second, where it tends to live, uh, then you should take these precautions when you are out in the woods. Uh, you should wear long sleeves and long pants, preferably with cuffs. You should take care not to uh, mess with any, uh, you know, with any deer um, or mice or squirrels or other small rodents. Uh, it is particularly something you need to take precautions with if you are deer hunting, because if you're deer hunting, you're pretty much gonna be messing with a deer, at least if you get lucky. Uh, so it is often a disease that is associated with hunters. Um, wear gloves when you are skinning and cleaning a dead deer. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and a, there is a vaccine for it, but the vaccine didn't end up producing long-term uh, immunity. Um, and it's not like you necessarily know when you're going to be at risk. Uh, so the vaccine didn't end up being financially viable and it is currently off the market. Treatment is very doable in the primary stage. Uh, the antibiotics are very effective then and usually clear it up. Once you get to the secondary and tertiary stage, the bacteria have probably gone dormant and may not even be in your body at all anymore. Uh, and most of the symptoms are being caused by your immune system trying to hunt down and kill this bacteria rather than by the bacteria itself. So antibiotics are much less effective in secondary and tertiary Lyme disease. Um, prolonged treatment with intravenous ampicillin and septriaxone, I think, something like that, uh, can sometimes cure the disease, um, or at least knock the symptoms down. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it's, it's very difficult to treat and you wanna catch it early. So just to show you some of the epidemiology here, you can see that uh, it is very common in the American Northeast 
basically from Maine through New England, down to New York, Pennsylvania, uh, up into Northern Virginia and Maryland in the Washington, D.C. area. It's also very common in the upper Midwest, particularly uh, uh, Minneapolis, or, uh, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and uh, to a lesser extent throughout Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and parts of Ohio. Um, those are the places where the tick lives. These people out here, like who got infected, probably had all visited one of these areas um, and just didn't realize that they were infected until they got back home, and so that was where it was counted. Uh, the disease is spread by the black-legged deer tick, uh, and it's a very tiny tick, and uh, about two-thirds of people who get bitten by it don't even notice it. Uh, so it's important to actually remain vigilant and check yourself for deer bites, or for deer tick bites, if you are visiting the woods in that sort of area. Yeah, and that is bacterial skin infection.